Big thank you to our sponsor, Adreno Spearfishing Supplies. You can find Adreno in Brisbane, Sydney, and Melbourne. They are one of the biggest and best spearfishing stores in the world and stock a full range of spearfishing gear, more than you could ever imagine. So check them out in store, or if you prefer to shop online, check them out at spearfishing.com.au. And do yourself a favor, at checkout, use the code NOOBSPIRO to save yourself $20 on all purchases over $200. So that is spearfishing.com.au and use the code NOOBSPIRO at checkout. Today's Noob Spirit podcast is also proudly brought to you in partnership with PenetratorFins.com. Get on there, guys. Have a look at some of the designs they've got. They've got clears. The blacks are beautiful. Check out the Noob Spiro custom Oki print. It's mad as well. Larry's got a full range of wicker designs, and he's got a beautiful finish on his fins. He's uh, recently updated his manufacturing process. It's even better than it was before. He makes some of the best fins in the world. Uh, he offers a full international warranty, along with $25 flat rate shipping worldwide. And uh, to, to make that offer even sweeter, pump in the code Noob Spiro at checkout and save another 20 bucks. PenetratorFins.com. Support the Noob Spiro podcast by shopping with our sponsor. G'day and welcome to the Noob Spiro podcast. Today we're speaking with none other than Sebastian Kramer. Now Sebastian Kramer was, is from Hamburg in Germany where they do not allow spear fishing. So what did he do? He packed up and he moved all the way across the world to sunny New Zealand. So Sebastian is now a Kiwi resident and Shrek gets very bromantic with this man and it's just a little bit weird but that's how he is with fellow Kiwis. But never mind that, the interview is absolutely fantastic. We talked to Sebastian all about spearfishing in remote locations and he shares a bloody great story about spearing the same sailfish twice in 10 days. So stay tuned for that. Now guys, I've got some very exciting news for you. The 99 Tips to Get Better at Spearfishing ebook is going into print. That's right, it's gonna be a physical copy of the book. And if you'd like to help us out and be a part of this book, you can do so. All you have to do is email me some pics um, that we can put in the book. You get a full photo credit, go on our thank you page, and you'll also receive a free copy of the book once it goes to print. So if you'd like to find out more on how you can do that, just go to our Facebook page. Uh, There's a blog post up there with all the details um, to help get you involved. In other news, one of our fellow divers, a guy by the name of Glenn Dixon up in North Queensland, uh, has been the victim of a shark attack and is in hospital recovering. Uh, but you can help Glenn and his family out by going to the GoFundMe website, a crowd, crowdfunding website, and you can donate some money there um, to help Glenn and his family out to get through this time. Um, otherwise, go to the Noob Spiro Facebook page. We've got all the details and links there for you to, uh, to go and help Glenn and his family out. Okay, all that aside, it's time to move on and get into our episode with Sebastian Kramer. So please enjoy, and it's over to Shrek. G'day and welcome to the Noob Spiro podcast. Today we are joined by Sebastian Kramer in New Zealand. He's got one hell of an accent. It's part German, part Aussie, part Kiwi. Very puzzling. He's all over the show, but he loves to take the piss out of Australians. So welcome to the show, Sebastian. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Welcome yeah, to the show, mate. <laughs> welcome to the How's show. How's it going? <laughs> hey, noobers. Uh, we, we can do them all here. All right, beautiful. Yeah, this might be one of the few episodes where you need subtitles, but if I speak too fast or you can't understand me at all, why you just... It's mainly me that they don't right understand. Down. Oh, good. We'll just turn the aircon off, so now that the uh, people are used to that bit of background noise, it's good. <laughs> so, Sebastian, you are a freediving instructor in New Zealand. You guide people. Um, you also you head overseas quite regularly. You've dived sort of all over the show. Um, just give our listeners a bit of an overview about yourself and, and how you got started spearfishing. Sure thing. Um, so, you know, I you introduced me originally not from New Zealand, so I'm, I'm, I'm a Kiwi, I guess, a German Kiwi, half Kiwi, half German. <laughs> so at least, G- I, at least I consider myself that way now. <laughs> so originally from Hamburg in Germany, uh, that's where I grew up. Um, I grew up surf casting mainly, so I did a lot of surf casting, a lot of fishing my whole life and started at a very early age to be by the water and, and loving the water. Um, and then about 10 years ago, I moved from... 
uh, from yeah from Germany to New Zealand to Wellington to study here. And uh, about nine years ago, I got into uh, spearfishing. So before that, I was more into uh, tank diving. Did a bit of work around the Great Barrier Reef and did my um sort of my open water tank diver there about 15 years ago. But yeah, since I started free diving, I haven't touched a tank. I have to say. Um, so you studied at Victoria University down there in Wellington. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, did a uh, management degree or what they also call a bullshit degree. It doesn't really teach you. <laughs> it doesn't really teach you that anything. Was, that was and, uh, yeah. <laughs> Shrek's glowing here. He loves these little Kiwi uh, connections. He hasn't been there in a yeah. hundred years. But studied management uh, too, so God. we're all over it, Sebastian. He's beaming. I can, yeah. uh, I can speak. Now, Victoria German University too, it was, and it was an interesting experience. And I got me uh, resident residency in this country, so I've been here for quite a while. Okay. Um, and um, yeah, went out on a uh, fishing trip in the uh, in the harbour with Pete Lamb. I'm not sure if you remember him. He's uh, been a fishing operator in Wellington for quite a while. And whilst I was on the trip, uh, was this guy next to me? He was, you know, throwing up quite heavily. He had too much to drink the night before, and it was rough seas as it always is in Wellington. And uh, he goes, ah, you should, you know, between throwing up, he goes, you should come out and try this thing spear fishing. I was like, oh yeah. <laughs> that sounds all right. <laughs> you know, give me your phone number. I will stay in touch. And um, again, I'm a guy named Fraser. I've taken him out on a couple of um, charters by now, and uh, he he got me onto it and showed me how to shoot my first butterfish. And uh, from from then on, I was quite hooked onto it. And um, that's basically how I got into spearfishing. And from from then on, so nine years ago, I was fortunate enough to travel quite a lot with work and uh, been able to learn from quite a few good people around the world in terms of free diving and spearfishing and it's really taken off from there. And okay. So no spearfishing in Germany? No, they don't like it over there. Eh? They uh, consider it animal cruelty. Um, you, uh, you, you're okay to take a big you know, net out there and have them all suffocate on a big fishing boat, but spearing they don't allow, um, which is a real shame. I mean, having said that, even if you were allowed to spearfish, there wouldn't be that much to spear around. Yeah. You probably, you know, I mean, we have got the northern and the eastern sea in Germany, and you probably get pollock. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with pollock. It's more like a like a cod, red cod or like a blue cod, yeah. but a more of a greenish color. They don't, they don't grow that big. Um, and then we've got flounder um, and herring. That's probably sort of your main major, you know, three species. So not the most exciting spearfishing there if you were allowed to. Um, having said that, if you go up to Norway and Sweden and stuff, you can get into some decent cold water spearfishing. Mm. Okay, cool. All right, so you sort of went over sort of how you got started there in, in Wellington and uh, where your sort of passion and interest comes from. You went on and you did your freediving instructor's um, certificate, and uh, where did you do that and what, what made you do that? Yeah, so I did um, my freediving instructor mainly out of the interest of learning more about the physiology, about freediving and learning more what goes on in my body and also just to really kickstart my freediving expertise and career, if you will. Um, so I wasn't actually doing it with the idea of teaching at the beginning. I was just, simply wanted to learn more about the sport and more about what happens to my body and how I can, you know, become a better freediver and spear fisherman. So that, that's what sort of got me into it. And I did it about five, six years ago um, through SSI. Okay. Um, and I had an Australian instructor by the name of Mike Wells. He um, had various records in Australia. Back in the day as well, um, and he came over to New Zealand and taught in Lake Taupo in the middle of winter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but needless to say, for anyone who doesn't know Lake Taupo, it's a very, very deep lake and it's very cold. And uh, even a five mil wetsuit in winter doesn't keep you warm for very long. But um, we did a week um, of teaching there, and um, that's how I got into it. So and then shortly afterwards, I started uh, my own free diving um, organization to teach free diving. Um, through SSI, mainly level one, and then recently I've also cross graded to Petty, and um, because they started a free diving course as well. Okay. And New Zealand, the majority of um, dive dive shops are all Petty courses, so I sort of align myself more with that these days, just to sort of um, you know get along with the shops better because they're not allowed to teach SSI if it's a Petty shop, for example. Yeah. Okay. All right. Mm. So with like taupo diving, um, I mean, I've I've done a little bit of quite a bit of scuba in there, and I did a really good dive, a drift dive down the Waikato above the Hooker Falls. There, did, have, have, oh, did, yeah. did you do some yeah. of that as well? I have, yeah. You see quite a few trout and eels and yeah. all sorts, eh? Yeah, wicked freshwater diving. 
It is. I mean, you probably someone would probably have a heart attack if you take a spear gun in there because they probably all think that you're after New Zealand's trout, which are highly, obviously, protected. Yeah, yeah, and tasty too. <laughs> From the spear or anyway. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah. No Didamo in there. Didamo. Didamo. Uh, you should know Didamo. Oh, uh, Didamo. The lovely algae. Yeah. Um, oh, I don't, see? I don't, I don't think they have it up there yet. Hey, it's mainly around the South Island and a couple of other rivers and lakes, but they're quite. Um, yeah, they definitely want you to spray your boat on and have a proper wash before you go to the next freshwater lake. I like so what Turbo spread. did there, Sebastian, but just between you and me, I think he's fully did a mo. He's fully did a mo. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know how that means. Uh, You'll figure yeah. it out. You'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we've got a bit of, bit more background on you. Where, where, um, what was your biggest obstacle starting out, and how did you sort of overcome it? Oh, funnily enough, the biggest obstacle that I had was the fear of deep, dark water. So whilst I could see the uh, bottom of the ocean, I was quite comfortable, but once everything sort of dropped off into the black and darkness, and I couldn't really, visibility was poor, um, I really had a uh, big mental hurdle a mental issue no a uh, big hurdle <laughs> big hurdle. i've got a few of them but no i had a big quite a we big do, mental buddy. hurdle to um you know dive deeper because you know sort of you know, the darkness really um really scared me and i don't know don't actually know what what triggered that and over the years obviously just continuing to dive and, and pushing yourself um i got past it at some stage um and obviously, before you ever saw a shark as well, there was that shark thing I was always worried about, you know. But now you're going to see the first shark. Is it going to eat you? Because you're really quite influenced by what, what the media shows you and what you've seen in movies. So um, when you're getting into it, for me, sharks and dark water was sort of what my, yeah, what, what really quite influenced me at the beginning. And the only way I got past that was really by, you know, repetitive diving and trying to relax as much as possible and, um, you know, looking at statistics and stuff and seeing how likely it would be to see a shark uh, back in the day, and that really helped me pass that. But that was probably my first sort of yeah. <laughs> first issue, eh? Darkness and black water and sharks. Uh, this is a good one, and to be honest, it's a, it's a different one. We, we've had one guest that sort of talked about something similar that I can remember, but I've, I've dived with a guy who's a, you know, uh, quite a renowned diver locally. He, he dives very deep, but um, I've dive some sort of darker colder water with him and like i noticed he pulled up a lot earlier than he normally does so i I, I think it's quite widespread so it's funny so you sort of said you looked at statistics and just sort of just (laughs) white white knuckled through it i guess Uh, yeah i mean it was the only way to get past it eh? and i mean um you you slowly go deeper you know you, you slowly find out what's actually out there you know, and then as as I managed to you know get overseas more and you know, dive in cleaner water, you become more comfortable with sharks and shark encounters in general, which obviously you know, like a, no- a normal occurrence if you're doing a lot of blue water hunting or if you're going up further up north in, in New Zealand, um, and just really getting across some of the fears that aren't really based on anything other than your imagination and you know media and movies. So. You know, the, like the best, you know, the best training for free diving with spearfishing is going out there and doing it, and continuously doing it. And the more you do it, the, the more comfortable you get with the whole scenario. Sebastian, uh, your Skype profile pic is you peering between the bill and the <laughs> sail of a big sailfish. So uh, this brings us nicely to our next story, our next question, which is, could you give us your most memorable fish story? <sighs> There's, there's quite a few, I have to say. Um, the billfish, and that was my only billfish to date, uh, certainly was one of them. Um, and that happened uh, last year in Tonga. It was uh, not my first billfish encounter, but the first billfish that I've landed. Um, and uh, I was um, <clears throat> organizing a charter to go over to Tonga, and we've um, actually, we're lucky enough to land two sailfish on that trip, um, both ranging between, you know, 30 to 37 kilos. And, um, yeah, very, very awesome encounter. We were drifting off a uh, island in the you know, kingdom of Tonga in really quite crystal clear water and had a flasher going. And uh, not much was happening, actually. We were pretty close to um, moving spots because we couldn't see anything. There wasn't really any current or anything. Nothing was happening. And I was like, right, this sucks. <laughs> let's call the boat over and let's move spots, right? And um, just as I said that, I saw two sailfish coming up from from the deep, checking out the flasher. One comes up the flasher line, 
basically two meters. I could have pole speared him. Wow. He was that close. He came straight up to the flasher, came up right up next to me. He was, I've got it all on video as well. Um, and he was literally two meters away from me. So when I shot him, um, I strung him. So the shaft went straight through him. He took off and he, um, as, he as he took off, he actually um, you know, did a kind of a half circle around the flasher as well. So the flasher got hooked in it and the flasher and the line and everything I used to break away system completely took off and <laughs> just disappeared. And I was like, well, I'm not sure if I'm going to see this fish again or if I get my float line back or <laughs> anything attached to it. Um, and luckily I did. Um, I swam after him and he got a bit tangled. Um, his tail got tangled in the shooting line and he was um, <clears throat> swimming on the surface. And um, yeah, I got him back. Funny story as that is, on the very first day of that trip, we were on a 10-day charter. And um, first day I got there, I shot a sailfish. I lost it. And when the fish came back up on the flash, there was two of them, as I said earlier. One of them didn't have a hole in it. The other one did. Yeah. So I shot the one with the hole, thinking it was injured. And after I landed it, um, I, f I realized that I shot the same fish within 10 days. So on day one, I shot him and lost him and then on the last day of the trip i landed him so it was it was quite special quite a special um it's quite a special fish and story behind it as well yeah. i'm glad i landed him um because the stomach contents it was very empty so because I, I shot him the first time through the gills and through the gill plate but um they shake their head very very strongly so they jump quite a lot and they shake their head so the um if you just have a single barb that can come out quite easily so and that's what happened on the first shot Maybe Jamie's no. right. Maybe it is a bit cruel. This be <laughs> <laughs> you don't dispatch him on the first time, eh? <laughs> Ship at first, you don't succeed. Yeah, but that was the story behind the um, yeah behind the picture that you see there on on the Skype profile. So, which part of Tonga were you in? Were you in Ha'apai? Um, not this time. No, we were diving off Tonga Tapu, off the main island. Okay, cool. What? Yeah. Got another good fish story for us? I kind of led you into that one, but maybe you've got your own ah, you want to share. You've got a few. Um, so I guess uh, the most memorable it's a tropical big blue fish. Cost off Capity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. 2.5 kilos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it tasted amazing. <laughs> Sorry, Sebastian, I interrupted you there, buddy. Um, now, I guess the other uh, sort of the two, or well, the three fish that really stand out was definitely a sailfish, um, a 40 kilo Malabar grouper. Oh, wow. Um, which was in Tonga as well. That was a year prior. It was two years ago. And we were part of that. Was, that was actually a funny story. I was up <coughs> out with Rob Torelli, which is running the Blue Water, ch uh, Blue Water Charters out there. Yep. And um, we joined the um, the fishing club in Nukualofa, and they had a spearfish, like a fishing competition on, right, for the day. And we approached them and said, look, can we, a spearfisherman, join the competition and they obviously thinking we wouldn't really pull much out of the ocean they went yep sure <laughs> join so you know basically every fish was a go and we tried to obviously put as much fish on the boat to to win the competition and um we um i got a 40 kilo um sam that works for adreno he yeah. got a 42 or 43 kilo malabar short of the world record it wasn't far off and we landed about oh, three or four other big fish, but we, we weighted in about 170 kilos of fish. <laughs> <laughs> and we won the competition, uh, which was this really expensive deep sea fishing reel. And all the spearers just looked at it and it goes, What do you do with it? So, I don't know, it looks expensive. <laughs> so we felt a bit, you know, we felt a bit cheapish, you know, just entering a fishing competition as Spearos and um, winning it. And since then, Spearos are banned. So Spearos are not, <laughs> well no longer, Good contribution no longer to... welcome to join the spear fishing or the fishing competition in Ukalofa Fishing Club. But <laughs> we had a good day. <laughs> we had a good day out. Spiro line fishermen um, relations were just severed, eh? It's mm. good. Yeah, exactly. And then I guess the last most memorable fish was when I was in Hop High. A um, friend of mine over there, he um, works in one of the resorts over there and is quite lucky to go out spearfishing quite a bit. And uh, he landed a 51-kilo dogtooth tuna in that week, which I helped him land. And then on the last day of my Hapai trip, I shot a dogtooth tuna, tuna that was between 80 and 100 kilos. Wow. It's really hard to tell. It was the biggest fish, but, you know, way, way bigger than a 51-kilo one. And Basically, he came up from behind me. I looked to the left. I was just shocked. This monster was sitting right next to me. <laughs> I had a 1.3 roller gun with a single flopper and 
clothes were inadequate and the float line wasn't probably strong enough for it either and just yeah sh- well, i was like oh should i shoot it or not i think all spiros every spiro probably pulls the trigger but yeah i did and um yeah pretty much destroyed most of my gear I ripped the float line apart and bent the shaft to bits and uh, unfortunately we lost it but um that was probably the biggest fish that i've ever shot at yeah wow. <laughs> unfortunately i did which is a real shame, of course, but I hope um, it was a shoulder shot, so there was a good chance that that size of fish might survive. Yeah. It's always oh. a bummer when you lose them, eh? but um It happens, though, and um, and it's a good point you make, and it's not something we've really talked about a lot as being sort of inadequately geared for, um, you know. That's right. Uh, but it, it does happen, especially when you're in an environment like Tonga where you've got these huge yeah. drop-offs off islands and uh, phenomenal clear water, and the dog tooth kind of sneak up on you sometimes you can be on the the edge of an island there just like in 10 meters and dog tooth come in well yeah. we've had marlin come in we've had marlin sightings over there and, and and anything can swim past that's the reality of it and one of the big lessons especially for people that start going over to the tropics and start traveling is buy decent gear because if you don't have it you're going to lose fish you're going to injure fish that are likely going to die um you know i mean i'm not i've made these mistakes i just had to learn from it and and adapt and grow but you know i mean one of the tips i guess for people that travel a lot and get into blue water hunting is a find gear then it's not too heavy that you can actually take with you but also to have it like a good float line a good gun either with a breakaway system or double flopper you know enough flotation devices a couple of atmosphere floats and um yeah, so that's that's I you know I I tested out quite a few things and over the years and I really learned that uh, if you shoot a big fish, <laughs> you need the right gear to go with it and unfortunately that's not cheap. So. Joining us today and supporting the show is SpearedApparel.com. The all-new Novo wetsuit requires no lube. That's right. It's got full fleece lining. So if you've got a crappy old wetsuit where you're getting cold, the neoprene's just gone and it's got less life in it than Turbo's undies, then it's time to get yourself a brand-new Novo wetsuit. I think they come in a 3.5 mil, and you can save 10% by using the code NILBERS at checkout. So if you're confused about that, it's N-O-O-B-E-R-S speedapparel.com and check out just pump the code and save yourself 10% guys if you're on the hunt for some new equipment check out Adreno Spearfishing Supplies at spearfishing.com.au they have a huge range of gear they've got great prices and if you use the code noobspearo at checkout you'll save yourself $20 on all purchases over $200 so check them out at spearfishing.com.au and use the code noobspearo at checkout Sebastian, after those two horrendous stories of big fish getting off, um, could you share with us uh, your, your, your favourite hunting technique? Well, my favourite hunting technique is really um, just, it depends what you hunt, right? So obviously if you hunt on the reef and stuff, it's a bit different because uh, hunt, I mean, reef species are a lot more flighty. Um, but uh, my passion really is the blue water hunting. It's it's a big logic, so that's, that's where my passion lies. Um, and you got to really managed to well find find this zen moment right where where your whole body is kind of in tune with the ocean where you're totally relaxed where you've got a good system going where you dive down to about 15 or 20 meters on the flasher or you know, looking at the flashes a few meters away from it and um, scanning scanning the water and uh, not scanning around you left right and center uh, without moving too much and um <clears throat> Once you see a big fish coming, whether that's a dog tools tuna coming up in the burley or it's a wahoo or a sailfish or a marlin or whatever else, um, obviously each species has got their own behavioral patterns that you need to adapt to. And a great book to read is probably Terry Master's Blue Water Hunter. It's got a quite in-depth description of how each fish behavior is. But for me, basically, it's just, you know, you do repetitive dives. You try and get as relaxed as possible. You dive down, you hang in about 15 or 20 meters of water, and you simply have a look around and keep scanning. And if you see a big fish coming in, you know, I normally do some grunting noises in the back of my throat um, to entice a fish to come a bit closer. Go on, give us one of those. Yeah, give us, give us, <laughs> give us a grunt. Mm-hmm. <laughs> nice. Something along those lines, you know, different, uh, tones, different speed depending on the fish. But, um, yeah, and then um, really just making sure you don't swim swim right at the fish, that you swim parallel to it and um, try and get a good shot off. And also not pulling the trigger if you don't have a good shot. So 
So get close, eh? And um, get close till you till you can see all the color. I mean, if you're taking off, take a lot of beginners over there, and the first day is basically just spend pulling the trigger on fish and the shaft flies and it comes way short um, because people generally, you've got a different perception of blue water. Fish are way further away than you think and they're normally quite a lot bigger than you think as well. So um, you've got to wait till you see detail on the fish and till you're sure that you've got a good placement shot. Otherwise, you're going to lose them or you lose them to sharks or you're not going to hit them at all. And quite often, you don't get a second chance. Unless there's a big school of wahoo or something coming through, um, big schooling fish are a lot more forgiving. But if you've got a single fish swimming through, that's not going to likely come back if you shoot it and you can fall short. So. Cool. All right. Mm. Next section is called the toughest situation. So what's the toughest situation you've been in in the ocean? What was kind of like the scenario? What actions did you take? What happened? And um, what would you do differently next time? Well, I've, I've had a few ones. Uh, I've, had, I've had a diver blackout on me, um, a friend of mine, which happened here in Wellington off Kapiti Island, actually. <clears throat> we were diving. That was actually in my beginner day. So that was prior to me becoming an instructor, prior to me knowing a lot about shallow water blackout or what to do. Um, and, uh, yeah, my, my dive buddy dove down, and funnily enough, Nothing about what I heard about, you know, shallow water blackout really applied, basically. He passed out shortly after he left the surface, probably one or two meters down. Um, and, um, yeah, basically even completely limber, had to pull him back up, put him on the float and back on the boat and make sure that he recovers all right. And he spent quite a bit in hospital, a bit of time in hospital. What ended up happening was that um, he didn't actually black out through shallow water blackout, but um, he had a very unusual low heart rate. Um, anyway, so, um, you know, when the, the, the mammalian dive reflex kicked in and it halved his heart rate from, say, 50 to 60 to 25 or 23 heartbeats per minute, it was so low that it wasn't enough to supply his system with enough oxygen and he passed out from having a very low or too low a heart rate. So uh, um, wow. after figuring it out, um, he has to drink a few Red Bulls or have a few strong coffees before he goes out for a dive now. So it's like, you know, completely... Wow. Unrelated to anything else that you normally come across in terms of blue water blackouts or shallow water blackouts or any of that. So, you know, the reverse can be true as well. Your heart rate can actually be so low that your system can't deal with it and then shuts you down. So that was that was a scary one, uh, mainly okay. because, yeah. So when he, when, he, when he blacked out, um, you said it was before a lot of the training you've now done. Mm -hmm. What sort of stood out at you as being the most difficult thing about that situation? Probably knowing how to respond and, and, and what to do. I mean, I've done, in the prior to all this, I had done a first aid course back in the day, uh, but all this doesn't really apply that well to ocean scenarios, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it was scary to start with seeing him unconscious and floating, uh, like under the surface, and obviously you know, I pulled him up by his shoulders fairly quickly, got him back up to the surface, and... Um, basically called for help from the boat so definitely there was um the difficulty was like uh, definitely a feeling of help listeners not knowing what was going on and, and also how to respond um and then afterwards it was really just quite a worry figuring out what the underlying cause was and what we really learned was that doctors have got no idea <laughs> about <laughs> free diving or spearfishing related injuries um mm -hmm. there is really not much science well there's more science behind it now but most doctors simply don't know about it so the scary part of it was really afterwards figuring out what was going on with him mm -hmm. um going to the hospital and visiting him and not having any idea about what actually happened and what was going on so and everything that i knew about it didn't really match up with the shallow water blackout because that normally comes on on the ascent not on the descent so uh, yeah all right well, <laughs> well let's move into the veterans vault so this is the part of the show where we sort of ask our featured guests to take us deep into an area of the area expertise we were going to talk yep. with you today about um spearfishing remote locations and um we wanted to ask you a few questions about planning and reconnaissance and um, sort of what your process is for, for that. And um, I yep, hope sure. you've got some uh, some goodies in there for our listeners. So, cool. yeah, okay. So give us a bit of a background on if, w sort of where some of the remote locations are you've been to and, and, and what you've learned, I guess. Yeah, so as I said earlier, um, I'm very lucky in that my job allows me to travel at least once a year to remote 
normally tropical locations. Um, so I work in an IT in IT security, and once a year, uh, the boss sends me off to a, a remote, normally you know Southeast Asian country for a conference, and I can add on a bit of holiday, and that allowed me to do spearfish most of Southeast Asia. Um, and once once you start planning a trip. Um, and it really depends. You know, some people really prefer having an organised, well-organised trip um, from you know from the beginning to the end. Um, I, on the other hand, quite like flying to a new location and just figuring things out as you go along. Um, and the difficulty there is obviously that a lot of areas don't have any spearfishing charters. They don't necessarily know what spearfishing is, or or what you find in those areas is spearfishing is quite common, but it happens at night when the fish sleep, so it's very different from what we do, right? Um, so the difficulty is finding information um, when you go to a new area, especially if it's an area that hasn't been speared before, doesn't have any charter operators, and the way of getting around that is probably social media, trying to find dive shops over there and, and call them up and see if they allow spearfishing and, and what, you know, what situation is. Um, using Google Maps and uh, looking at areas that you're visiting and just to see what the ocean structure is, whether or not there's a big reef in front of where you are and finding ways past the reef barrier. Um, and then also obviously looking at legal requirements for um, that country. A lot of countries uh, don't allow you to take spearfishing gear into the countries. Um, there's restrictions in others. Um, and then you obviously got to know whether or not you can take your gear with you to start with. And once you sort of, you know, pick your location where you want to go and you did a bit of renaissance on the internet through dive shops, potential social media to see if anyone's been there before, and you figure it out that there's a good chance to go for a spearfish. And obviously, you've got to start planning to get the gear there in the first place, which can be difficult, especially if you only have a 20, 23 kilo luggage allowance, <laughs> and you don't know if you find you don't know if you find a weight weight belt over there, or if anyone can you know borrow you some lead. So um, <laughs> the weight restriction is definitely a hurdle. Um, and then once you get there, the, the next hurdle is um, the public perception of you running around with a spear gun and a wetsuit, <laughs> especially if they're not used to it. You know. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that, those are all difficulties in, in organising trips, and I mean, um, some of the locations I've been to, for example, Sri Lanka. Uh, Sri Lanka, back in the day when I was there, it wasn't illegal to spearfish. Now it is. Um, having said that, a local spearfish a lot at night time, and you can find locals that have ancient spear guns with car in the tire tubes as rubbers and they, they make things work but you can't take any gear in you have to find locals and simply go down to the port find some fishermen and have a good chat to them and uh, see if anyone is willing to take you out um, other, yeah, other locations like the Philippines for example I was quite lucky to uh, meet a um, Austrian free diving instructor which took us out spearfishing over there and um difficulties over there that it's a very dangerous place um you got like most tropical places you got no coast guard you got no fail safe right so if anything goes wrong you're in deep trouble so making sure that you know you're taking as much out of the danger out of it as you can that's obviously easier said than done if you're in the ocean diving off a boat with sharks around it and boats and that sort of stuff you know so you'd you'd take a first aid kit with you obviously on a trip like yeah. that what would yeah, you take, what, what would you have in there um, take a first aid kit, so definitely um, have some tourniquets, um, like a makeshift tourniquet. That's sort of more, you know, for shark encounters. And if you do get bitten or, or you have a big bleeding wound, you would definitely want to have a tourniquet there to close whatever artery that you know that's potentially been punctured. Um, you want to have some band-aids and potentially some uh, cor oh, I don't even know how to pronounce this coagulate, so something that coagulates the uh, the blood to make it thicker. Ah, right. uh, yep, yep, a coagulant, yep, yep. That's the one. I can't even pronounce that. Oh, good, man. <laughs> it's hard with a with a German Kiwi accent. <laughs> it is, yeah. Um, and then um, taking um, also quite often <laughs> taking a um, just a uh, like like the aluminium blankets you get you know the survival blankets oh, yep they can help you out if you get cold in the water and just wrap yourself in that to keep the wind chill and everything else away yep definitely take plenty of water so if a boat because out there you're relying on really old boats with dodgy engines and everything else to get you where you want to go yep right so there's a good chance that the engine doesn't get you back from where you left so you definitely want to make sure that you bring enough fresh water 
on the day and potentially enough food. But yeah, in the medical kit, you really just need nothing else but, you know, a good tourniquet, something coagulates blood, um, some some dressings. Um, that's sort of like, you know, you can't really carry an oxygen bottle or anything around. Um, yeah. I do that. I teach people so they can recover if they have a blackout. But in real, reality, if you travel, then that's not really that practical. Mm. Yeah, it's part, partly what, why I asked the question because, I mean, you've, you've, there's this compromise, isn't there, when you're traveling? Like, it's got to be light and accessible and, you, you know, you need some go-tos, but you probably can't pack everything. But I sort of want no. I mean, I did There's put, a really the good um, guy online, and I forgot what they call themselves, but he's done a trauma kit specifically for spearfishing. Okay. And he does sell it online. Okay. Um, you may have to research it and put it into the show notes later. Right, um, I'll try I can do that and flick you an email. But he's got a – he developed a trauma kit, which I think is between 100 and 200 bucks, okay. which basically covers everything that you potentially need in a free diving or spearfishing trauma kit. So right. um, definitely recommend getting one of them for anyone that uh, travels by themselves and spearfishes in remote locations. Cool. And – you talked about sort of meeting the locals and dealing with local perceptions. Um, can you give us an example of how you've sort of, um, you know, got in with the locals and managed to get out and do some some diving? What what sort of uh, you just polite and use hand signals, or how how do you go about it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I mean, as you said, hand signals is definitely a big one, and communication is a big one because yeah. once you go to these villages, most of them don't speak English, right? Yeah, I was just—I um, was going to interrupt you. Turbo would be really effective at the hand signal part. <laughs> while while we're doing interviews, he's hand signaling me all the time. It's never positive, so I don't know how he'd get on. Just, just cut. <laughs> <laughs> and he's get him giving off me the, the fingers <laughs> and telling me I'm a wanker <laughs> and all sorts of stuff. So oh, very expressive. Yeah, you'd be effective at that. He's almost Italian. He's that expressive. So <laughs> okay, so well, as long as you guys understand each other somehow, eh? <laughs> yeah. So when you're in Sri Lanka. And, and you're dealing with negative perceptions and they don't speak English very much. Um, what, what did you do? Uh, one good way of placating the public or the locals is always handing fish back to the community after you come out of the water, right? Okay. Um, you were in their waters, uh, there's, especially if you're heading or spearfishing around fishermen and stuff like that. They are quite territorial in the Asian countries around where you're jumping in the water and where they are. So we've had, had encounters where we had angry fishermen come up to the boat in the Philippines, for example, and whether or not they were pirates or they're angry fishermen, I don't know to this date. Um, we were anchored up somewhere um, spearfishing, and we had a boat come up with two guys, Bella Clavers, and like a traveling hawk, and they pulled themselves onto our boat, and they're talking very angry to the uh, Filipino guy that took us out. We, we don't know what happened on that day. We don't know if they were angry fishermen, if they were pirates, and they they kind of got came to some agreement but you get into situations where you don't necessarily understand what's going on but you do want to know you don't know that they're not happy that you were there and that's generally because you're in their territory they're fishing it's their fishing spot and that's where you're hunting quite often you've got fish aggregation devices like fads and stuff like that that someone may have actually placed there so it's their device okay and there might be a local understanding that four or five fishermen can share that but if you are new to the area you might then you know obviously step on someone's toes um, and the best way of doing that is obviously being apologetic about what you've done through hand signals and that you know you can make that understood and also if it goes further than just offering some of the fish that you've already caught as a gift and offering and generally most of the fish that we spear on these trips goes back to the villages so none of the fish are wasted um, and generally you pass it back to the villages where you either got your guide from or where you spearfish close to because, um, A, you can't eat it all, and B, it's, it's the right thing to do. It's their water, and it's just a sign of appreciation to give that fish back to the community and have it shared by everyone. Very practical. Anything else mm. with um, spearfishing remote locations? Sebastian, you got some, uh, some, some, any more tips? Well, one big tip is ideally have a good dive buddy that knows you and that looks after you, right? Yeah. Because the locals quite often, they're happy to sit in the boat and watch you, but they don't know what happens under the water. So whilst... There are quite a few people that probably are crazy enough to go out by themselves in remote locations. I wouldn't recommend it. I would always recommend traveling with someone that you trust. Someone's got your back and someone that can help you out of a dodgy situation. Also, someone that knows how to behave if there's an incident in the water, like a shallow water blackout or something similar. Um, I personally am not a diver, of, not, not a fan of diving by myself. Um, 
makes me really quite nervous. But that's because from the day one, I've always died for someone else. So, yeah, picking someone to travel with who gets along with you, and uh, not just in terms of spearfishing, but also in, tra- in terms of travel arrangements. And, you know, you have to be very similar in the way you like to organize things because once you travel and you get into these remote locations, you don't get along with someone. <laughs> You're going to have a pretty upset uh, person one of the two parties pretty quickly. So you pick someone <laughs> that's pretty easy going or at least along the same line as you. If you like it highly organized, then pick someone that's highly organized. If you're laid back, then pick someone that's laid back. But don't pick someone that's complete opposite to you because <laughs> otherwise you yeah, might, ter- ter- might the find yourself in a dodgy situation. Yeah. Tervo is the complete opposite to me, Sebastian. I, what I tend to do is just have half a dozen beers or so so that yeah, I don't actually good. mind. And, it makes uh, you super relaxed. Yeah, and then we're all good. <laughs> I'm and, really uh, his yang, him to my yang, you know, for real, together. Yeah, yeah. Together, uh, we're a formidable spearfish. We team. are, we are. We, but, I, you I know, feel you, there's a bit of bromance going on oh, there. Right? Oh, there's a full on bromance. I shoot fish, he fillets, that kind of thing. It's just beautiful. Yeah, there's nothing like, you know, you, you're duck diving Sebastian in a remote location, and the guy next to you, for some reason, has got his hands on your hips. Uh, I don't it's understand nice, it. It's got to guide you down. Very relaxing. Oh, it's, so. it's way better than someone having pulled down his bottoms and done a like real dodgy pull downstream and didn't oh, tell yeah, you. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> current. I mean, that's <laughs> we that's pretty terrible, too. You know? <laughs> we do that as well. Um, so, <laughs> so we mix it up a bit, but uh, yeah, no, cool. Any any other parting guidance there for diving remote locations and travel in general? Uh, really, just be safe. Be safe. Um, do if someone seems dodgy over there and, and they're really just after the money to take you out. You know, just just be aware that. Most of these countries you're going to, they're very poor. People want to make a quick buck, so make sure that either you know you get recommended to someone you know. Obviously, quite often that's not possible, but you know, just go with your gut feeling. Mm. If it okay. doesn't feel right, or you've got a weird feeling with someone going out, then don't. Um, I, I've been lucky in that I haven't really been in too many dodgy situations where something actually went wrong, but um, that's because I sort of followed my gut, and it probably works for most people. But yeah, just be safe. Learn the, learn the laws of the country before you fly them, before you bring your gear. Otherwise, you might lose it at customs and you might not get it back. We've, um, we've talked to a number of guides in different locations and that, and uh, it always impre- – like, I, I like to be fairly self-sufficient and do things on the cheap, but I think sometimes <laughs> – I think some, <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it's a smarter idea to pay someone with the experience. It's not like they're going to mummy you. But, um, it comes down to time, right? Yeah, it's like exactly. how much time have you got to spend? If you've got five days, then you're better off paying a bit more money and going on a charter. If you've got a month, then hey, yeah. you might figure it out yourself. Yeah, cool. And uh, yeah, yeah, all right, awesome. Hey guys, today's Veterans Vault is brought to you by Cheryl Daly. That's right, Isaac's mum. And the reason it's brought to you by Isaac's mum, Cheryl Daly, is because she just bought a copy of What Shriek. Yeah, 99 tips to get better at spearfishing. She said in her review, this is way better than buying chips from the shop. Yeah, she loves her fashion chips, that's for sure. But more than that, she loves throwing a feed of fresh fish straight in the chilli bin. So thanks, Mrs. Daly. So if you would like your own copy of 99 tips to get better at spearfishing, where can they find it, Shrek? Go to Amazon.com and get your hands on some actionable information to improve your spearfishing. All right, next next. Let next next change in the show. It's a change of pace. It's time for the funniest thing that's happened to you on the water, Sebastian. What are you've you got, got a poo story. I've sensed yeah. it before. It's a bad poo oh, story. Certainly, I've got a lot of stories. I've got a pool story, but most of these stories <laughs> are probably stories. funny to other people. But they all happened to me, so they weren't that funny <laughs> to me at the time, but very funny to everyone else. Good. All right, I well, love these ones. Um, so I guess one of the funniest ones was. Um, Four, four. In hindsight, funny <laughs> uh, was the Philippines. We were, said we were diving, and we had this weird encounter with these fishermen or pirates. We didn't know what they were, and they weren't quite too impressed with us. They were quite angry, and we sat in the water and we had our guns loaded, and we're like, "What's going on here?" And knowing that back in the day when we were there, that the Philippines was the kidnapping capital in the world. So, <laughs> anyway, so that was that was a bit dodgy. Um, and then shortly after, we kept diving, and um, I was just duck diving down, and then this massive explosion occurred. There was this massive sound wave traveling through the water. I nearly shat myself, but then what I wasn't <laughs> what I didn't know is that it's very common in the Philippines still to fish with dynamite. Mm. And um a boat not too far away from Uber diving chucked in a stick of dynamite and <laughs> so I tell you what, not fun really? at all. 
In hindsight, hilarious, not so funny. Oh, it doesn't <laughs> sound funny at all. What, nah, it sounds scary. What's the pressure wave like underwater? Like, what does that feel like? Um, I have to say, it's just uh, the sound is probably what the most thing. Uh, like the sound wave that hits you is pretty deafening. Um, and then the, the pressure wave wasn't so bad because it was about a you know nearly a kilometer away from where we where we dove. But um, yeah, it wasn't pretty. Uh, definitely, my ears were ringing for quite a while, and you, like you do feel it in your body, you feel a shock wave in your body. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we kind of discontinued diving after that and sort of moved spots. But um, wow! Yeah, in hindsight, it was definitely a good story to tell. But yeah, it, on the day, it wasn't it wasn't that funny. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't think so. <laughs> as I said, and then on the, on the same day, or on the, on, the, on the same trip, as I said, um, there was a pool story. And I know you guys do love a good oh, pool story. Oh, we love it. We all about the pool <laughs> story. It should be no spirit of poo stories yeah. plus some other shit. You know, yeah. obviously being in the Philippines and, and then them having pretty interesting food choices over there and street vendors <laughs> not always <laughs> selling the cleanest food. You know, we yeah. went out for a few beers the night before and, and ate pretty much everything that we shouldn't have eaten, including sort of big pieces of meat and stuff like that. Anyway, my uh, dive buddy wasn't feeling too fresh on the day and threw up a few times before he came out in the boat and he had violent and diarrhea and <laughs> unbeknownst to me um, anyway so he uh, we were diving together and he was watching me and we normally watch each other when we dive and he goes oh I'll be back in a bit I was like okay not not telling me what he was on about and then he swam uh, downstream <laughs> pulled his pants down and did his business and um, swam back to me and didn't say anything about what he did and then about <laughs> a couple of minutes later I was involved in this uh, brown cloud of um, <laughs> Pooh, that uh, unbeknownst to me, he <laughs> <laughs> he dropped us, did you? <laughs> uh, so that was that was a funny one. In hindsight, again, not funny at the moment it happened. It was disgusting, but uh, that in hindsight, terrible. very funny on his part. <laughs> and, uh, and so yeah, definitely. I don't think I'm the only person that happened to either. You know, where, uh, where, because you, once you're out there, you've got really nowhere to go, right? So it's. Um, you gotta go. You gotta go. Otherwise, diving is not much fun for the rest of the day. Who goes diving with violent diarrhea, though? Uh, if hey, we're in a, Southeast a, Asia together, Tough diving, people, I am going to do it to you. I'm going to replicate that story definitely. And you can hold a lot of shit. You're full of it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, Sebastian, that was a great couple of stories. Um, next section of the show is dive bag. So head to toe in Wellington, windy old Wellington. What yep. are you wearing? Uh, you and know when you get so there, much about New Zealand, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I've got so I've got two different dive bags: one for the tropics and one for Wellington. Okay. In Wellington, you basically always wear a five mil suit. I'm sporting a Torelli suit. So shout out to Torelli; they have been sponsoring with, with some gear over the years, and <clears throat> the Torelli suits work really well. I'm wearing a five mil camo suit. Um, from them, that works really, really well. Also, you using uh, the Torelli carbon fins, which uh, work really good. They're really good fins. Um, to probably, you know, have probably brought my kick cycle down by at least one or two kicks from um, normal fins. So that that was really, really quite good. Um, got um, Kevlar gloves that are also Torelli. Um, they really help with the crayfish and stuff. Yeah, in the Wellington area. Oh, jeepers! You go through some gloves in Wellington, pulling crazy. Oh, yeah. oh, you do. Yeah, and if you um, if anyone ever pulled out crazy without gloves, which I can't recommend, um, you know you need good gloves. Yeah. No, I'd recommend <laughs> they it cut your right open. Yeah. Doesn't heal very nicely either. Mm. Um, what else have we got in the bag? Um, socks, Torelli. So basically, head to toe in terms of neoprene and rubber, it's all Torelli. Mm -hmm. Yep. And um, I also use a Torelli gun, a 1.2, um, 20 mil, 20 mil rubber gun which is sort of good for everything from you know your cod to the occasional kingfish in summer yep um and uh i've got a torelli dive knife as well so basically everything is torelli in my bag <laughs> well, well, so just torelli 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 and... yeah well if you get sponsored and if it's great gear you know yeah. why not and, uh, they do a good had, job over there um then in the tropical recently bag, with it yeah, the tropical bag is quite different. Okay. Um, in the tropical bag, I've got a Hex suit, um, okay. which I've been sporting for about nearly a year now. Um, and I've taken that on quite a few tropical trips. Um, for those of you guys that don't know what a Hex suit is, Hex is a new patent-tested sort of technology that hides your electromagnetic signals um, and makes encounters with 
sea life a bit more relaxed, if you will, um, because they can't really fuel electromagnetic signals in the water. It allows you to have some pretty cool encounters with fish, which, um, you know, when I I first started out, you know, I wasn't really 100% convinced that it works for me. And I did take the wetsuit out on like multiple tropical trips and I had some pretty cool encounters that I wouldn't have had in another wetsuit because okay. the other guys I dove with, they just didn't have anywhere close in encounters with the species and I did. So definitely believe, believe in their technology. They've got a really good service. So wetsuits are really good. If anything goes wrong, they repair it for you. So the hex suit, um, hex gloves and hex booty. So it's basically the whole integrated sort of system. Yeah, system. Yeah. Um, so shout out to them for, for the suit. Um, it's working really great. Um, then with guns, I've really experimented quite a bit over the years for the tropics. I've gone off big wooden guns. I had a big um, blue water rife, but when you travel a lot, it's very heavy to carry around. Okay. Um, I sort of, I looked for a long time into sort of lighter options and been trialing a, um, a Royce up, which is a inverted uh, roller gun out of Europe. Yep. Uh, which it definitely packs a punch. Um, that's been working really quite well. It's a 115, very small to travel with, mm-hmm. yeah. very compact gun. Um, and then um, I recently also had a custom made hatch gun built for me, um, just for the bigger fish, mm-hmm. for the you know tuna and everything sort of past 50 kilo. Yep. Um, H- a Miro hatch, a Miro, is that it? No. Oh. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah, Miro hatch is uh, 1.2. Yes, yep. that's called a Miro. That's right. Okay. And I've got what they call the uh, the Rhino Rhino Chaser series, I think. Okay. That's normally you know Rhino, big animals, big big fish. And that's uh, sporting uh, three rubbers, uh, eight mil shaft, and then I've got it as a double flopper setup, and then as a, um, a, uh, a sort of breakaway system, and then also with a um, uh, with a detachable head. Okay. So two setups here. Um, and um, have a 30 meter float line from from Wetty, yep. Um, uh, with two Wetty floats. Um, recently added some Rob Allen floats to that, and um, yeah, using the same fins, the same carbon fins in the tropics. They work really well across both cold water and, and the warmer water. Yeah. Um, also in the tropics, I use my dive watch. Um, um, Sporting a Sorento T4i. Okay. Uh, personally, one of the most important pieces of kit in my bag because quite often with the visibility in the tropics, you don't know where you're at, you don't know how deep you are, you don't know how long you've been there. So I find a dive watch a very, very good um, tool to make diving safer. Um, okay. So that really helps. And um, that's basically my dive bag there. And then when I go to the tropics, I also take obviously a lot of Ziploc bags and, and vacuum pack all the fish that I shoot over there to take it back home. Okay. All right, cool. What's your process for zip locking um, fish? Do you just fill it up? Poor man's, poor man's zip lock. So poor man's basically yep. vacuum packing. So you take your zip lock, zip lock bag, you get a bucket of water, you put your flits in there, yep. you submerge the zip lock bag in water, push all the air out, yep. you zip it tight, you chuck it in the freezer in the hotel or wherever you stay, and then just before you leave, you try and find a sterile form box somewhere where you can put all your fish in, you tape it shut, and then you can take it back. Oh, nice. um, New Zealand is pretty forgiving you, as long as you declare it you can take it back. Awesome. I'm cool. sure if you guys are as lucky, but I think so, eh? Yeah. 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 Uh, both countries tend to look after their biodiversity. Uh, I think every country's sort of going the same way. Anyway, um, so, but that's an interesting process you follow there. So, cool. Guys, if you're looking to improve your free diving and spearfishing, a good set of fins is pretty much mandatory. And the best fins going, in our opinion, are the Penetrator fins. So get online, get on to penetratorfins.com and check out the full range there of composites and carbon fiber fins. Composites are tough as nails. They're a fantastic fin. And the carbon fibers are the most reactive fin going. We absolutely love them. Can't kill them either. Had them for years. They're still going strong. And the best thing about this is now we have a code for you guys. So if you pump in Noob Spiro at checkout, you'll save yourself $20 on a set of these great fins. Add to that, we we now can offer you $25 flat rate shipping internationally. That is absolutely fantastic and a full international warranty from penetratorfins.com. So there's no reason not to get in and get yourself one of the most important pieces of spearfishing equipment. That is a good set of carbon or composite blades. So get in there now, check out all the great designs and get yourself a set of penetrator blades. 
Um, next round is Spiro Q and A. This used to be our fast five facts for news, but we've sad to say it, guy. We've I'm changed sure. pace oh. a little bit. So yeah, no, I do remember the Mexican. Oh. <laughs> it was the best, wasn't it? Oh, see, see him go, you know. Yeah. Pirate Pete and Pirate what Pete. was the other guy? Oh, what was that? What was he called? Our audio producer. He hated, hated it, mate. He hated it. Oh, really? Yeah. He canned that <laughs> real quick. <laughs> oh, I want to see a renaissance and get him back. Oh, but yeah. right left, you know? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, so this is still a, fa a faster paced round of questions, though, Sebastian. But um, sure. who's been the most influential person or people in your spearfishing and why? <clears throat> no, Spiro. Apart from no spirit podcast, but you can give us a mention now. Of course, then you know from day one they've been a long no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got a good mate of mine that took me sort of under his wing when I first started out by the name of Ben in Wellington. Um, he was, uh, you know, a long time spiro that knew the Wellington area very well, and I sort of bumped into him in the dive shop, and he took me along and showed me some of his spots and techniques and that sort of stuff. Um, not being a Kiwi, not having grown up here, not having spearfish my whole life. When I did start, you know, that was really a great help. Yep. Um, I think when most of us, sort of our generations so of 10, 15 years ago, started spearfishing, there wasn't really that much information around. So he was a really good help. So shout out um, to Ben. Shout out to Ben. Um, then um, I had a guy in the Philippines that, um, by the name of Wolfgang Darfit, which is from <laughs> um, from Europe. <laughs> Every you German's got a wolf game mentor. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he really helped me as well, getting my depth in and, and taught me some really cool techniques. Cool. And then in terms of the free diving stuff, a shout out to Mike Wells, my free diving instructor. He really turned turned it up for me, like going down quite deep and being nice and relaxed in the water. Awesome. Um, that's probably the sort of biggest three influences, not just on spearfishing, but on free diving in general. Yeah, nice. All right, okay. So if you had to start out spearfishing all over again, what would yep. you do differently? If I were to start spearfishing from the very beginning, I would probably invest in slightly better gear from the get-go. Um, most beginners tend to buy a cheap package for 900 bucks or whatever it costs and try and get everything sorted because once we start hobbies, we don't really know if we're in it for a long run or not. Yep. But yeah, probably buy proper gear. Uh, yep. Buy proper gear from the get-go. That, that's probably the one. Okay, cool. What's the single best piece of advice you've ever been given in spearfishing? Enjoy yourself. A lot of us get really caught up with social media and someone shot a bigger fish and everything else and we can get so hung up by trying to beat someone's PB and whatever else and you're out there to have a good time. So, you know, as, as Gia Tar said before on a different podcast, the best spearers want to enjoy themselves the most and I really believe that. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I've, I think I've listened to that. That was on Roman Castro's The Spear. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah he, no. he's, he's, had some, he's had some awesome people on his show. So, no, cool. Yeah. All right. And... Um, one to three pieces of advice that you'd give out to you know a person learning spearfishing. Well, um, being in the uh, age of social media that we are, do not pay too much attention to what's happening on social media. Because a, there's a lot of trolls out there, and I'm really getting quite frustrated with it. It's you know, spearfishing communities and blogs and stuff. There's still a lot of heckling and stuff going on, and watch a video if you're a beginner and someone goes down to 30 meters and you go, yeah, I want to do that. Reality is it takes a while to get there, right? So people watch these videos and then they come on a course and they want to start and they get really disheartened that it didn't make it to 30 meters on the first day. And well, step back, this is going to take time. So, you know, don't don't have too huge expectations of yourselves. Take it slow, you know, and don't don't pay too much what's happening in the social media. So I think it's a big one these days. It's, okay, yeah. cool. Any Any other sort of short bits of advice you give or do you want to move on? Uh, no, um, definitely in terms of advice, like um, safety is, is a big one, right? So find a good dive buddy to get along with. Um, make sure that you know, they can be trusted. I mean, when, when you go out, you meet a lot of people that you could dive with and finding someone that you get along with and that looks after you and you know, can take a while, that's really important. Um, and also just um, not being afraid of asking questions. Um, I find it quite often when I teach, you know, when, when once the students leave, it's like, look, get in touch, contact me, um, go out for a dive with me, but the reality is most people don't. So don't be afraid of, you know, contacting someone that's potentially a bit more advanced than so you asking for advice and uh, maybe even asking to be taken for a dive. Don't ask for spot X, but, you know, um, just <laughs> just find your own, but, you yeah. know, just ask them to take you under, under their wing a little bit and, and teach you. Don't be afraid to ask questions. 
All right, cool, Sebastian. I'm going to link up some of your profiles and links. Uh, you've got, uh, you take people out spearfishing in Wellington and you're a freediving instructor. Can you just tell us a little bit about those aspects of your your, yep. your work? Yep. Yeah, sure. So um, basically, I've got two businesses, uh, freedivetraining.co.nz, which is uh, the tr- teaching or training organization where I um, teach people to freedive. Yep. Um, teaching both SSI and PETI level one. Yep. Um, and that, you know, you can just find most of the information on the website there. Okay. And then the spearfishing charters, uh, probably more important to the wider audience because it doesn't really, it's not restricted to Wellington. Um, so I've been organizing charters to Bali, um, to Tonga, um, around Wellington, around, you know, the north uh, Coromandel area. Okay. And some other locations for quite a while. So if anyone is ever interested, I'm just touch base and um, I'm coming over in March. I'm going to look you up. <laughs> <laughs> Come along on a on a fun trip. Yeah. Stop the fridge, buddy. All right. And uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you're on social media as Sebastian Kramer, are you? What What do you got? What do you What do you yeah, most so I've got, on? Um, Sebastian Kramer on Facebook. Um, <laughs> on Instagram, it's um, cbass three seven eight one. Oh, Turbo's on, adding you. Yeah, on the website is freedivetraining.co.nz and spearfishingcharters.co.nz. Oh, cool. And they've both got links to Facebook as well. All right, I'll link the stuff up in the show notes along with some of the other things we discussed today. And uh, Awesome, Sebastian. Um, anything you want to say to our audience, parting comments? Well, get out there, be safe and have fun. That's probably the most important thing. Um, just enjoy what you're doing and be safe. Matt? Cool. I've had a ball today, Sebastian. Thanks for joining us all the way over there from Windy Old Wellington. Yeah, yeah, it's been windy. Only 180 k last night, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> Only takes a course three or four days to settle down now. So hopefully I'll get out in the weekend and get to chase some yellowtails, which just appeared, so that'd be good fun. Yeah, cool, man. All good. Thanks for joining thanks us. Thanks for joining us. Awesome. Continue to good work, and uh, thanks for the opportunity of being on the show. Thanks for joining us today with Sebastian Kramer. It was an absolute cracker. We love bringing it to you. But our next episode is with Peter Saunders, the president of the USFA, the governing body down there in New South Wales. And it's an absolute cracker as well. Peter's a great bloke and he's got some great stories. I particularly like stories about uh, gear and guns and, uh, and how all that stuff sort of come along over the years. So tune in for that one. That's coming out in a couple of weeks' time. Thanks for listening. Thanks for your support from myself and Shrek, and we hope to see you on the water soon. G'day, guys. Thanks for listening today and joining Turbo and I in the studio with another great guest. Now, today's show was proudly brought to you in partnership with spearfishing.com.au. Adreno have also put together a code for listeners of the Noob Spiro podcast where they can save $20 on all purchases over $200. That's right, punch in the code Noob Spiro when you buy your next spear gun or wetsuit at spearfishing.com.au and save yourself 20 bucks. It's a no-brainer. Shop with our sponsors Adreno at spearfishing.com.au and support the Noob Spiro podcast. Guys, I just want to bring your attention to the new Speared Apparel wetsuit. It is called the Novo, and you can find that at speedapparel.com. And if you use the code NOOBERS at checkout, that's N-O-O-B-E-R-S, at checkout, you'll save yourself 10% on any purchases. So that's really great, and thank you for Speed Apparel for getting on board. Now, the great thing about the Novo wetsuit is it doesn't require lube. So unlike Shrek's leather chaps on a Friday (laughs) night, no lube's required to get in or out of this wetsuit. So get on board, check them out. They look fantastic. The color's great. Speedapparel.com.